the clinical features in syphilis today with you all. I'm also grateful to East West Pharma for arranging this platform. Syphilis is uh, one of the most important sexually transmitted infection. When we were postgraduates, I did my postgraduation from Government Medical College, Mysore. Mysore being a tourist place, we had opportunity to see a lot of cases of syphilis. But over the year, the syphilis cases dwindled. And as I started my practice in the northern part of Kerala, it was rare to see uh, syphilis except few latent syphilis cases. But once HIV infection and AIDS became a big problem, we started seeing slightly more cases of syphilis. So understanding, being able to diagnose and investigate and treat syphilis is still very important and forms an important learning point for all postgraduates who are doing their MD in dermatology, sexually transmitted infections. And one of the most comprehensive definition of syphilis was given by Stokes, who defined syphilis as an infectious disease caused by trypanema pallidum, which is systemic from the onset, characterized by florid manifestations on one hand, years of latency on the other hand, capable of involving practically every organ in its course, simulating almost every disease in the field of medicine and surgery, and is transmissible to the offspring in man and to certain laboratory animals, and treatable to the point of presentative cure. So that is why the age, ye no syphilis, ye no medicine. So if you understand syphilis, you will be able to differentiate it from many of the medical and surgical conditions. It was Hunter who did his initial experiments. That's why the primary chancre is also known as Hunterian chancre. He, in his one of his experiments, took pus from the vagina of the prostitute and inserted into the urethra in a male volunteer and that person developed both syphilis and gonorrhea and so he came to the conclusion that both these diseases are caused by the same etiology. This was way back in the early 18th century. It was Philip Ricard in 1838 who proved that they are different diseases. Fritz Shodin and Eric Hoffman in 1905 identified trypanema pallidum. So the etiology of syphilis is trypanema pallidum, subspecies pallidum. Belongs to the order Spirochetales, family Spirochetaceae, and the genera trypanema. The other organisms in this genera include Borrelia and Leptospira. So in addition to trypanema pallidum, subspecies pallidum, which causes syphilis, the other species in this genera include Trypanema pallidum, subspecies Pertenia, which causes yaws, subspecies Endemicum, which causes endemic syphilis, and subspecies Keratium, which causes Pinta. The Nicolaus strain was isolated by Nicolaus from the spinal fluid of a patient with neurosyphilis, and the organisms was grown on the rabbit testis, and it is still maintained for experimental studies and known as Nicolas tree. So classification, it is classified mainly into acquired syphilis and congenital syphilis. I've been asked to discuss on acquired syphilis and so I'll be concentrating on acquired syphilis. And acquired syphilis is further classified into infectious early syphilis and non-infectious late syphilis. The early syphilis is further divided into primary syphilis, secondary syphilis, and early latent syphilis. And late syphilis is divided into late latent syphilis, tertiary syphilis, which includes benign tertiary, cardiovascular syphilis, and neurosyphilis. So if you look at the natural history or the natural course of syphilis, 
which was learned by the infamous studies, the Osler study, Tuskegee study, and Roshan studies, where people who developed syphilis were not treated because at those times there was no definite treatment and they were followed up to understand what happens to these patients. So after exposure to infection, an incubation period of 9 to 90 days, on an average it is around two to three to four weeks, the patient develops primary syphilis. This is known as a primary shanker. This, this primary syphilis or primary shanker heals within about around two weeks' time. And later, the patient will develop secondary syphilis. Usually, the clinical features of secondary syphilis start appearing around eight weeks after the exposure to the infection. But in some patients, it may appear even before the primary chancre has healed. And in others, it may appear quite late, even up to six months after the risk of exposure to the infection. The lesions of secondary syphilis can subside within a week or two and may relapse two, three, or even four times before they completely clear off and patient goes into a latent stage. In this latent stage, the patient will not have any clinical signs or symptoms of syphilis, but he'll be seropositive. So this latent phase has been further divided into early latent and late latent. The early latent is the infectious phase. And as per the UK or WHO criteria, it is up to two years after infection. Whereas the European and U U.S. criteria says in one year after infection. After that period, the patient moves to late latent syphilis. Here again, there are no clinical signs or symptoms of syphilis. The patient continues to be seropositive. He is less infectious or non-infectious. Out of this latent syphilis, around two-thirds of patients undergo remission not developing any further features of syphilis and their serology also gradually over a period of many years become negative. Up to one third of these patients in latent syphilis may manifest tertiary syphilis. Around 16% of them develop benign tertiary syphilis. 6.6% develop neurosyphilis and around 10.5% of the patients develop cardiovascular syphilis. So let us try to find out or understand what are the clinical features or signs and symptoms in these different phases of syphilis. As I said, the primary syphilis appears after an incubation period which may vary anywhere from 9 to 90 days. On an average, it is around 3 to 4 weeks. And the classical lesion that you get in primary syphilis is Shanker, also known as primary shanker or hunterian shanker or a hard shanker. It starts as a erythematous macule of around three to uh, millimeter to three centimeter size, which evolves, evolves into a papule and that ulcerates to form a single painless indurated ulcer with a relatively clean base. So this is associated with lymphadenopathy, which is initially usually unilateral and can become bilateral. The lymph nodes are small, firm to rubbery and discrete, and they do not suppurate. So this is a classical presentation of primary chancre or primary syphilis. When the chancre you palpate, the induration is similar to palpating your button. So the ulcer is that hard. So button-like induration. So when this ulcer is on the mucosal surface of the prepuce, and as the patient tries to retract the prepuce, the prepuce tends to flap back or fall back. This is known as 
Doriflopsin. So primary chancre occurring in the coronal sulcus because of its constant contact with the glans penis will result in development of an ulcer over the glands also. This is known as kissing ulcer. And if the high-risk behavior is with use of condom, patient may develop an ulcer over the root of the penis or on the shaft of the penis. And this is condom shanker. But often you might see non-classical presentation also. Patient may come with multiple ulcers. Patient may come with painful ulcers. Or sometimes even mixed shanker. That is both chancre and chancroid occurring in the same patient. The common sites for the primary chancre in the males include the coronal sulcus, glands, shaft of the penis, prepuce, frenulum, and the urinary meatus. And in the female, it is over the vulva, foreshade, vagina, perineum, uh, or the cervix. So on the left side, you can see the classical picture of a indurated ulcer or the pupusial skin. On the right side, you can see indurated erythematous ulcer with a lymph node, which appears inflamed because of the secondary infection. So the ulcer of the primary syphilis has a clean red base, and that helps us to differentiate it from other genital ulcers. And the induration is very typical, which will not see in any other genital ulcers. This is another example of a indurated ulcer over the glans penis. And the picture on the right side shows ulcer of the labia majora. Then ulcer can occur on the cervix also. So this you can only make out when you do a Vaginal examination. Uh, this is very important because these ulcers may be missed and they continue to transmit the infection and later manifest with secondary syphilis. And this is an example of kissing ulcer over the glands and coronal sulcus. The primary syphilis can manifest in the extragenital sites also, depending upon the sexual activity of the person at risk. Anorectal ulcers are common, especially in homosexual individuals. can also be seen in heterosexual contacts when penoanal intercourse is done. Oral lesions occur due to oral sex. And the lesions may be seen on the lips, gum, tongue, the tonsils, and sometimes the pharynx. So an oral examination with a tongue depressor and good light is very important when you are examining a patient with high-risk behavior. Shankar redux or monorecidive shankar is occurrence of shankar at the healed site of primary chancre. This is uh, seen in patients who have had uh, incomplete treatment while taking antibiotics for other diseases or can occur in patients with secondary syphilis also. And this chancre redux is an infective lesion and it is full of tryponema and it can transmit infection. Pseudochancre redux is a gammatous ulcer occurring over the genital area at the previous site of chancre. And this is non-infective because you will rarely find tryponema in that lesion. Sometimes syphilis can present with only balanitis or inflammation of the glands and prepuce. Uh, this is known as Fallman's balanitis. And this lesion is also teeming with uh, spirochetes and is highly infective. Syphilis DMB is occurrence of uh, secondary or tertiary syphilis in a patient with no signs or symptoms of primary lesion. This is uh, usually seen uh, following the transfusion of blood with 
spirochetes or sharing needles in drug abusers. So these patients ma manifest directly with secondary syphilis without any evidence or history suggestive of primary lesion. So this is an example of oral ulcer. This patient had presented with this ulcer, which is being treated as aphthous ulcer, not responding to the usual uh, treatment regimes. And when we palpated her nodes, she had uh, firm non-tender nodes in the submental and submandibular areas. She gave history of having had kissed her uh, boyfriend and her VDRL was positive and she responded to a single dose of benzathine penicillin. This is another patient we saw in our uh, institution two weeks back. So it's important because uh, more than one uh, conditions can be coexisting in a patient. This adult male presented with two weeks history of this purulent discharge from the urethra. He was uh, having uh, homosexual activity for the last two years. And on doing a gram stain, we were able to demonstrate presence of uh, gram, uh, gram, gram, gram negative diplococci within the neutrophils and the culture grew the seria gonorrhea. But when further investigated, he was found to be uh, HIV ELISA positive and his VDRL and TPHA was all, were also positive. So he had HIV infection with syphilis and gonorrhea. So combinations of more than one sexually transmitted infections can occur sometimes in patients and this has to be kept in mind. The complications of primary syphilis include phimosis, erosive belenitis, lymphangitis, thrombophlebitis of the dorsal vein and phagedonic chancre all due to super infection over the syphilitic lesion. And it has to be differentiated from other genital ulcers like genital herpes where the lesions are multiple, painful, small with arcuate borders, chancroid, multiple uh, tender ulcers with uh, allonecrotic floor and buvo, donovaniosis, a, a, a beefy ulcer which is non-indurated and uh, if at all there is a buvo, it is a pseudo-buvo and LGV, where the genital ulcer is very transient or evanescent and easily missed, and patient most often presents with the classical bubo. Non-STA, traumatic ulcers, Bechet's ulcer, Crohn's disease, fixed drug corruption, tuberculosis, and squamous cell carcinoma may have to be kept in mind as differential diagnosis of genital ulcer. Moving on to secondary syphilis, it starts after or sometimes before primary chancre heals. The clinical manifestations of secondary syphilis are protein and they can involve any organ. Flu-like prodrome may be seen, but most often it is missed because the symptoms are mild and patient usually presents with skin rash and lymphadenopathy, which are the most common manifestations. The rash can be macular, maculopapular, papular, papulosquamous, psoriasiform, annular, pustular, follicular. <laughs> the only lesion that you don't see is a vesicular lesion in acquired syphilis. The rash is usually bilateral and symmetrical, asymptomatic and tends to be discrete. It is more, upon the, uh, more often seen in the upper limb than the trunk and the lower limbs. They have a predilection for the palm and sole and in today's era, most of the patients who we have seen have presented with lesions in the palm and sole. So any patient presenting with asymptomatic lesion in the palm and sole uh, who, who is in the sexually active age group with uh, no other uh, signs or symptoms suggestive of other palmoplantar scaly lesions like psoriasis or palmoplantar keratoderma, you would always keep in mind possibility of secondary syphilis take a history and investigate for the same. You might sometimes be surprised to diagnose secondary syphilis. The macular lesions are uh, often not uh, uh, seen in our patients. They are more uh, appreciable in fair individuals. Uh, they are known as roseola syphilitica. Uh, the papular lesion appear as classically a coppery 
papules which are discrete and when you uh, press this lesion with the blunt end of the pin uh, with the head of the pin patient will experience pain this is known as bushkiel and drop sign this is very typical in syphilis and it is due to the endarteritis obliterans <clears throat> this is one patient we had seen a couple of months back who presented with uh, uh, profuse papillous convulsions all over the trunk unlike from what i described the lesions are confluent here yet those lesions in the palm and so and on genital examination the lesions are present in the genital area also you can even see a small ulcer over the glands he was vdr and tpj positive and hiv positive so a florid manifestation of secondary syphilis is still seen nowadays especially in hiv in individuals with having uh, msm activity this is another uh, case uh, seen in our institution uh, our institute uh, the photo courtesy of dr rakesh sv this patient presented only with these pomoplantar lesions and uh, his serology was positive he had a history of high risk sexual behavior so the other lesions are corona veneris classically described in syphilis where uh, papillous squamous lesions along the hairline uh, appear as like crown of venus it's called corona veneris follicular syphilis if it occurs is the only condition where these lesions are pruritic otherwise the secondary syphilis lesions are asymptomatic the bushkiel and drop sign i already uh, you know, uh, described necklace of venus when the lesions sometimes they appear along the uh, nape of the neck uh, i'm sorry along the uh, front of the chest in the v area uh, resembling a necklace they are called necklace of venus sometimes lichenoid lesions annular lesions lenticular lesions corymbos lesions they all can be present uh, as manifestation of secondary syphilis and the lesions of secondary syphilis when they occur in Uh, uh moist areas of the body like uh, the groin the scrotal skin axillae uh, perioral area they they uh, appear as flat top uh, whitish moist lesion these are called condylomata lata they are highly infective lesions teeming with spirochetes they have to be differentiated from condyloma acuminata lesions occurring over the angle of the mouth will appear as split papules in the mucus uh, oral mucosa they may appear as mucus patches or snail track ulcers then uh, hair may be affected uh, they may appear as uh, patchy alopecia in the scalp or known as classically described as moth eaten alopecia or sometimes patients may present with telogen effluvium systemic involvement Uh, in the form of lymphadenopathy generalized lymphadenopathy uh, classically we look for upper posterior cervical lymph nodes and epitrochlear nodes uh, which are almost always involved in secondary syphilis and help us to uh, differentiate it from other causes of uh, generalized lymphadenopathy it can affect the musculoskeletal system in the form of periostasis joint effusions uh, then it can affect the gi tract as hepatitis hepatic injury raised uh, transaminase levels sometimes uh, in the stomach as ulcers uh, with uh, gastric dyspepsia then it may affect the rarely the renal system presenting as uh, nephrotic syndrome uh, neurologic involvement in the form of meningoencephalitis and uh, cardiac involvement uh, in the form of uh, conduction blocks can be seen in secondary syphilis lewy maligna is a severe type of secondary syphilis characterized by severe necrosis and ulceration of the lesions this is uh, seen in patients who have immunosuppressed uh, on uh, immunosuppressive medication or or having severe hiv infection so this is a picture of lewy maligna with uh, necrotic lesions secondary syphilis can sometimes relapse it's seen in around 10 to 25% of cases uh, during each relapse the number of lesions uh, keep uh, reducing they become smaller in size and they are asymmetrical sometimes meningovascular neurorecurrences can occur in secondary syphilis 
periosteitis, then eye manifestations like iritis, chorioretinitis, and optic neuritis are more common during uh, secondary syphilis relapse. And as I said, uh, hepatitis. Sometimes only serological relapse can also occur during secondary syphilis. So these relapses can uh, occur uh, uh, two, three, up to four times has also been described. And the differential diagnosis for the lesions of secondary syphilis, the macular rash has to be differentiated from rubella, measles, HIV, seroconversion, papillar and papillosquamous lesions from uh, psoriasis, lichenplanus, PR, fistula lesions from fistula psoriasis, uh, syphilitic alopecia from alopecia areata. So the latent syphilis, these patients will have only positive syphilitic serology in the absence of any clinical signs or symptoms. As I said earlier, as per WHO and the UK, it is up to two years after infection. They are detected usually during routine screening done for job abroad or during uh, pregnancy or for uh, any uh, uh, such conditions. And uh, most often happenstance treatment of taking antibiotics for other medical condition will result uh, in latent syphilis. <clears throat> Syphilis in HIV is very important because most of the cases that we see nowadays in our clinical practice is with relation to HIV positive individuals. Uh, syphilis increases HIV transmission by fourfold. It's very common in uh, patients with MSM activity, up to 10 times more incidence of syphilis. Majority of the patients have the usual course and manifestation, but sometimes they can present with uh, primary chancre, which are large, sometimes they are multiple and painful. Leomeligna, as I said, has been reported in HIV. And asymptomatic neurosyphilis is supposed to be more common in patients with HIV, and they also may uh, progress faster uh, to uh, neurosyphilis. Syphilis in pregnancy, the lesions may be larger and more conspicuous and indurated because of the in increased vascularity in the genital area. Cervical lesions may show extensive erosions and fissuring and they heal with uh, scarring and may interfere with uh, normal delivery. Late study, <clears throat> based on Oslo study, uh, if untreated, uh, one third of all patients may undergo spontaneous cure. The remaining 50% may develop benign tertiary, 25% neurosyphilis, and 25% cardiovascular syphilis. So latent, late latent syphilis is seropositivity without clinical manifestation after two years of infection as per the criteria that we follow here. They are less infectious and requires more prolonged treatment. The benign tertiary is characterized by gamma, which is a proliferative destructive granuloma affecting the skin, soft tissue, and the bones. The visceral and CNS lesions may present as space-occupying lesions. In the skin, they present with nodules or noduloulcerative lesions which are indolent and heals very slowly. They may appear in the bones as localized pain, swelling, tenderness, which manifest in the x-ray as periosteitis or gammatous osteitis or sclerosing osteitis. And soft tissue gamma can occur on the tongue, stomach, liver and the myocardium. This is one interesting case we saw in our department and uh, the photos were contributed by Dr. Svira Kesh. This is a young adult who uh, presented to the Department of Medicine with uh, uh, recurrent stroke-like uh, syndrome. And on, on, on his skin, these lesions were seen and he was referred to dermatology. We found that he had atrophic uh, plaques and anitoderma-like lesions. And when we further examined, he had these scars on the genitalia. And on investigation, he was HIV positive and his VDR and TPHA were both positive. His CSS examination also showed CSF positive, CSF VDR positive and he was treated for neurosyphilis. So uh, uncommon presentations are quite common. Uh, I will not go into details of neurosyphilis and cardiovascular syphilis. They manifest with meningeal, acute splitting meningitis or meningovascular syphilis, parenchymatous lesions, general paralysis, stabies, or tabopyrosis or only optic atrophy. The gamma may appear in the cerebral uh, cortex or the spinal spine. Cardiovascular, usually after latency of 10 to 30 years, the typical lesion is the aortic aneurysm, or the patient may present with 
aortic regurgitation, coronary artery stenosis, and myocarditis. Coming to our experience, this has been there. If you look at the uh, uh, literature, Indian literature, uh, most of uh, the, the cases that we see, the males are more common, 325 uh, cases we saw in the last uh, uh, 10 years, uh, 121 females and three transgenders. We had three patients who were transgenders who presented with syphilis. And uh, late latent syphilis was the most common presentation. Uh, 289 uh, cases we had seen, all of them either uh, screening for job abroad or screening pre-surgery screening or screening due to pregnancy. We had seen only two pregnant patients who were uh, VDL positive. Out of this, uh, there were also 12 early latent cases. 90 of them were indeterminate because the, the uh, exposure date was not uh, sure and all these 90 had to be treated as uh, late latent uh, syphilis with three doses of benzathine penicillin. 33 of our patients who uh, on uh, doing, we routinely do uh, CSF evaluation uh, with the help of the medicine department. 33 patients were uh, found to have asymptomatic neurosyphilis. So that shows the importance of doing CS, uh, CSF examination. We had seen 10 primary syphilis and 15 secondary syphilis cases. So this is, uh, this is uh, the kind of uh, uh, cases that we see in today's uh, scenario. And this has been the experience if you look at the literature uh, uh, or other areas. So uh, these are uh, some of the clinical uh, findings, signs and symptoms since uh, syphilis. I think I've uh, used the, the 30 minutes uh, uh, allotted to me. Thank you. Thank you for your wonderful presentation as well as your MCQ structure. It benefit for our, our, our pages. And uh, we are going to invite our second speaker. Dr. Reena Chandan is our next speaker, is going to present our speaker. And before that, Madam is an associate professor and she is from the Department of Dermatology and Venerology at the Government Medical College, Rwandan. Madam has 20 years of teaching experience and trained in aesthetic dermatology. Madam has published various articles in search as well as the national white articles. And my area of interest is aesthetic dermatology and pediatric dermatology. So with all this uh, small introduction, we are requesting Madam to give her lecture to you. So thank you, Madam. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Rajiv sir had uh, very well uh, told about the clinical features about syphilis. So next topic is investigations in syphilis. So this is, uh, since syphilis is a multi-stage disease, the investigations also depends, varies according to the stages of the disease. So already sir has discussed about uh, syphilis. Syphilis is defined by Stokes as, a, as an infectious disease due to trypanema pallidum of great chronicity, systemic from the outset, capable of involving practically every structure of the body in its course and distinguished by florid manifestations on one hand and years of completely asymptomatic latency on the other. Able to simulate many diseases in the field of medicine and surgery, transmissible to offspring in man, transmissible to certain laboratory animals, and treatable to the point of presumptive cure. So this is the definition given by Stokes. Classification has already been dealt with primary, secondary, latent, tertiary syphilis. And the natural cause of syphilis has also been discussed. The infection with trypanema pallidum after an incubation period of 90 90 days, followed by primary syphilis, then secondary syphilis, then the latent stage where all signs and symptoms disappear with only serological positivity and, la and later into the late syphilis stage, the latent stage, late latent stage, as well as the tertiary stage. So diagnostic test for syphilis. Diagnostic test of, for syphilis has been broadly divided into two. Direct demonstration of treponema pallidum and detection of antibodies, that is the serological test. This direct demonstration of treponema pallidum is definitely done during the early stage of syphilis. So uh, we had already seen that the early stage of syphilis is primary, secondary and early latent stage, that is the infectious period of syphilis. The detection of antibodies occurs after the, um, the detection of antibodies occur a little bit late, that is 
during the uh, primary stage, the antibody uh, starts to develop. So serological tests are useful for the detection of antibodies. These antibodies can be directed against specific treponemal proteins. There are about 20 polypeptide antigens and antibodies directed against specific treponemal proteins unique to treponema. They are the treponemal test. They are the specific test. Antibodies against the non-specific lipoproteins, that is cardiolipin, cholesterol, lecithin, which is released due to the infection by the treponemes, as well as the damage caused by the treponemes to the mammalian host tissue. They are the non-treponemal test. So the antibodies against non-specific lipoproteins are the non-treponemal test. So diagnostic test for syphilis broadly divided into two, direct identification of treponema pallidum and serological test. The under direct identification of treponema pallidum, you have dark field microscopy, direct fluorescent antibody testing for treponema pallidum, silver staining, nucleic acid amplification test, poly polymerase chain reaction, and immunohistochemistry. Under the serological test, you have non-treponemal test and treponemal test. So first is the dark field microscopy. You are directly demonstrating the treponemes. This treponemes, treponema pallidum has got a characteristic morphology and characteristic motility. So we are directly demonstrating these two properties by examining in the dark field microscope. The one point we should remember is that the treponemes should be viable to view under the dark field microscope because we are viewing the motility as well as the morphology. The sensitivity is approximately 80 percentage and the specificity is 94 to 100 percentage. It is very useful in the diagnosis of primary, secondary as well as congenital syphilis. So materials, the lesion material, the serous exudate from the primary shanger, as you see in the first picture, the primary shanger, the lesional exudate will be taken. The skin lesions, condyloma lata of the secondary syphilis, snuffles of congenital syphilis, as well as the skin rashes, all these are high with treponemes. So from these, the lesion samples can be taken, collected, and viewed under the dark ground microscope immediately to view for the morphology as well as motility. So how will you collect the specimen in dark field microscopy. First, the lesions are cleaned carefully with gauze and saline. You should not use soap and disinfectants. And gentle squeezing, you have to get a serous exudate. If there is bleeding, the blood is wiped away and serous fluid is collected directly onto a clean glass slide by pressing the glass slide directly onto the lesion. And the cover slip is positioned onto the slide and it is examined immediately under the background microscope because if there is a delay the motility will you will not view the motility so treponema pallidum is a very delicate organism you have to get the uh, exudate from a primary shanker or the secondary uh, syphilis skin lesions or from the snuffles of congenital syphilis or the skin rash Keep it on the glass slide, view it immediately under the dark ground microscope. So the basic principle in that is in that is in difference to the normal microscopic examination is here in dark ground microscopy, only the light rays striking the treponemes at an oblique angle enter the microscope objective. So the aim of this uh, oblique angle, the light rays striking the treponemes at an oblique angle is for that luminous appearance of the treponemes against a dark background. So you can see there is a light which comes from below and when it passes through the dark field condenser, this is, it passes through the periphery, it falls on the objective and strikes the treponemes at an angle. So these treponemes are seen as luminous objects against a dark background and it should be done in a dark room. This is the dark field microscopy. Basic principle is a light source from below. There is a dark field condenser and uh, the light rays pass through the periphery, reaches the specimen, and then it is viewed under the object. <coughs> so what are you viewing under the dark ground microscope? 
two things you have to look for. One is morphology and one is mobility. Treponema pallidum has eight to 14 number regular tightly wound spirals. Now this is important because the number of spirals as well as the regularity differs in differ, different treponemes. The common cell spirochetes, they have irregular morphology. Whereas Treponema pallidum has got regular morphology, tightly wound, tightly wound spirals with eight to 14 in number. They have got pointed and tapering ends and the length is six to 20 micrometers in length and the width is 0.1 to 0.18 micrometers. Motility is the slow and deliberate forward and backward movement Corkscrew movement along the longitudinal axis is characteristic. So in this picture, we can see the regular spirals of the treponema palma. So the ground microscopic examination is not recommended for oral and rectal lesions. Why? Because these sites contain the common cell spiroketal organisms like uh, treponema, refringens, phage DNS. So this can give false positive results. So you cannot take lesions, uh, the lesional material from the oral lesions or rectal lesions because it can give false positive results. So dark ground microscopy, do not take lesions from oral and rectal lesions. The presence of treponemes with characteristic morphology and motility confirms the diagnosis of early syphilis even with negative serology. So it is highly specific, 94 to 100% specificity. The sensitivity is around approximately 80%. So even if serological test is negative and the clinical features of primary syphilis or secondary syphilis is present, definitely you can take the material for dark ground examination. And you can repeat the serological examination after two weeks. So here you can see the treponema pallidum, the mobility of treponema pallidum, the regularity of the spirals, the other treponema refringens, denticola, phage denis, the, all these are common cell treponemes found in the oral cavity. So the next is the direct fluorescent antibody test. So this is another method of detection of treponema pallidum. So direct identification of treponema pallidum. Here, the living motile treponemes are not required. It is by the fluorescent antibody technique that the treponemes can be demonstrated. It is 100% specific differentiating treponema pallidum from non-pathogenic treponemes. And since the fluorescent antibody technique is used, it can uh, specifically identify treponema pallidum from the tissues, from the lesional exudates, from the rectal lesions, from the oral lesions, from formalin fixed paraffin embedded biopsy specimens and body fluids. So that is the advantage of direct fluorescent antibody test over dark ground microscopic examination. So after collecting the specimens, it can be tissue specimens, exudates or body fluids. You have to dry it on the slide, fix it with acetone, stain it with fluorescent label and treponemal pallidum monoclonal antibody. That monoclonal antibody is specific for treponema pallidum and that is 100% specific. So this is the picture. This is the basic principle. So here you can see the treponema pallidum. Uh, that is whether it is uh, uh, the treponema pallidum, whether it is from the tissue or the body fluids or the lesional exudate, it is treated with the anti-treponemal pallidum, monoclonal antibody, which is fluorescent dye. So and that gives a complex. And the right side, you can see that apple green fluorescence of treponemal. It is a highly sensitive and specific method. The next direct method of identification of treponema pallidum is by PCR, nucleic acid amplification technique using polymerase chain reaction. There are different types of polymerase chain reactions used for it. The routine PCR, nested PCR, real-time, reverse transcription PCR. So what it does is it detects specific DNA sequences that is specific for treponema pallidum, the genetic material specific, specific for treponema pallidum. And the three main target genes used in, in NAT is, in PCR is, Paul A, TPP47, 
and BMP of treponema pallidum. So by nucleic acid amplification technique, if you identify this DNA sequences, then it is specific for treponema pallidum. It is valuable in the diagnosis of congenital syphilis, neurosyphilis, early primary syphilis, and also in distinguishing new infections from old infections. Samples used are lesional sites, genital, anal, or oral ulcers, surface rashes, tissue lesions, mucosal erosions. The sensitivity and specificity of nucleic acid amplification test in syphilis, it depends on the method of NAT. Like we said, there are different types of polymerase chain reaction used, and each polymerase chain reaction, whether it is nested or real time, uh, determines the sensitivity and specificity of the test. It also depends on the stage of syphilis. Uh, early, that is the Shanger specimens, that is primary syphilis, early syphilis, primary Shanger specimens has the highest sensitivity and specificity of routine PCR, 89.1 percentage in Shanger specimens. But uh, except for ulcer specimens of primary syphilis, the sensitivity of syphilis specimens in other stages is unsatisfactory. So we have to keep that in mind. In the early stage of syphilis, that is the primary syphilis, the Changa stage has yields a high sensitivity and high specificity. <laughs> Next, we go to the second method of diagnosis, that is a serological test. It has always been the gold standard for the diagnosis of uh, syphilis. It is based on the detection of antibodies in the patient's serum. The antibodies, we know it can be against non-specific antigens or it can be against the specific treponemal antigens. If it is against the non-specific antigens like cardiolipin, lecithin, and cholesterol, it is non-treponemal test. And if it is against the specific treponemal antigens, then it is called the specific treponemal test. And at least 18 treponemal specific tests are cleared for use in US. So who to test? Investigations in syphilis, we will do for symptomatic patients as well as asymptomatic patients. Symptomatic patients, all patients with signs and symptoms of syphilis infection, we will do the serological test. Any sexually active patient with undiagnosed genital ulcer, we will do serological test. Any patient who present with neurological signs and symptoms like cranial nerve dysfunction, chronic headache, meningitis, stroke, especially young stroke, Yes, and if there is no alternative cause identified, you have to do a serological test. Patients who present with signs and symptoms of aortic insufficiency, if no other cause can be identified, test, serological test for syphilis should be done. Asymptomatic patients, all pregnant women during the first antenatal visit should be subjected to serological testing. All women delivering a stillborn infant after 20 weeks of gestation, serological testing is indicated. High-risk patients, that is those patients with multiple sex partners, males having sex with males, users of crack cocaine, illicit drug use, all need to have serological tests for syphilis. Partner screening, those, pa those patients, uh, those persons who are partners of patients with syphilis, early syphilis, that is primary, secondary, or early latent syphilis, should have a screening for syphilis, partner screening. And any individual with HIV or any other STI should be screened for syphilis. So as I said earlier, non-treponemal test or the non-specific test are detecting antibodies against the lipoidal antigens. What are the lipoidal antigens? They are the cholesterol, lecithin, cardiolipin antigens. Where are they released from? They are actually antigens. They are released from the damaged fossils and possibly from the treponemes itself. This cardiolipin released from treponemes, they are highly antigenic. 90% it is lipoidal, fatty acid. So they are highly antigenic also. There are mainly three tests which come under non-treponemal test. Venereal disease research laboratory test or VDRL test 
rapid plasma reagent test or rpr test toluidin red unheated serum test trust mainly vdr and rapid plasma reagent test are the two main test frequently employed what are the treponemal tests or the specific test that detects antibodies to treponema pallidum antigens? One, fluorescent treponemal antibody absorption test. Second, treponema pallidum immobilization test, TPI. Treponema pallidum heme agglutination assay, TPHA. Treponema pallidum particle agglutination assay, TPPA. Treponema pallidum latex agglutination assay, TPLA. Treponema pallidum enzyme immunoassay TPEIA. Treponema pallidum chemiluminescence immunoassay TPCIA. So, this enzyme immunoassays and chemiluminescence immunoassays, they have become very popular because they can detect treponema infection early itself, very early itself, even at the stage of before the primary stage itself, at the primary early infectious period itself. This enzyme immunoassays and chemiluminescence assays detect treponema. So the timing of different serological response we should be aware of. And usually after the, the time of infection, you can see at the time of infection, usually at around the two, uh, at around the second week of infection, the fluorescent treponemal antibody absorption test becomes positive. Actually, antibodies are formed after uh, between a one or a two weeks period, but it becomes detectable at the end of second week. And then IgM antibodies are the first to appear. At the end of second week, it becomes detectable. Fluorescent treponemal antibody absorption test is the first test, serological test to become positive. Then after a period of uh, for, at the period of about four weeks. At two weeks, IgM antibodies appear. At about four weeks, IgG antibodies appear. And the VDRL test becomes positive in between four to six weeks of infection. TPHA becomes positive after four weeks of infection. non treponemal test measures level of anti-lipid antibodies reagent produced in response to lipodal material and treponema pallidum cardiolipid. Sensitivity varies and you can see that the non-treponemal test that is the VDRL RPRL test are highly sensitive for secondary syphilis and early latent syphilis stage, the infectious stage that is 97 to 100 percentage and 82 to 100 percentage in early latent syphilis. Non-treponemal test, why non-treponemal tests are used for initial syphilis screening? Because it is relatively low cost, easy to perform, and it has the ability to be quantified. This ability to be quantified in titers, that is helpful to assess the disease activity and to monitor response to treatment. It is mostly positive within 10 to 14 days after appearance of the primary chamfer and also four to six weeks after the beginning of an infection. So when does VDRL test become positive? Or when does RPR test positive? When, when should you ideally do a VDRL test? Means after the appearance of primary chamfer, 10 to 14 days after appearance of primary chamfer, the test becomes positive. Or you can say four to six weeks after the infection, it becomes positive. It is always positive in the secondary syphilis stage, recurrent stage, early latent stage, and also majority of the late latent stages. But the disadvantage is that even though it is a sensitive test, false positive results can occur. So first we will deal about venereal disease research laboratory test. It's a slight microprofilation test. And the basic principle is based on antibody reagent detection against the VDRL antigens. Cardiolipin cholesterol less than previously, it was the natural antigens that were uh, extracted from the beef heart. But now CDC has uh, recommended synthetic antigens. And what you observe is that if antibodies are present in the patient's serum, a precipitate formation occurs. So the patient's serum is heat inactivated. 
56 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes for complement inactivation. It is mixed with the buffered saline suspension of VDRL antigen. This, this VDRL antigen, you, you, when it, um, um, the patient's serum and VDRL antigen are uh, come mixed in the glass slide, I'll show you the picture. This is the glass slide, the VDRL slide, about two to three, two, uh, uh, two by three inches in size. There are 12 wells. There is a 14 millimeter inner diameter and 1.75 millimeter depth. And the patient's serum and the buffered saline, a buffered VDRL antigen is taken in the glass slide. And then it is diluted with saline. And you are looking for Clumps, clump formation. So you can see in this picture, the non-reactive picture, the weakly reactive, as well as the strongly reactive when flocculation or clumps are formed. On the right side, you are seeing the pictorial diagram where one is to one indicates that the patient serum and the VDRL antigen has reacted and there is uh, uh, flocculation formation. The second slide, one is to two, indicates that the patient's serum, VDRL antigen, and the saline has been added to, for dilution, and still there is flocculation. And this is serially diluted. And you can see there is one is to one, one is to two, one is to four, one is to eight. So in dilutions, this flocculation is occurring. So the highest dilution in which you get the, the flocculation is the titer. That is the highest dilution. If you get one, a one in 60 dilution, the flocculation is present, then that is the titer taken as the for VDRL test. So here you can see the non-reactive, one is to one minimally reactive, one is to two, one is to four, one is to eight, one is to 16, and it goes on till one in 2048. So one dilution, that is one in eight to one in 16 means one dilution. One in four to one in eight means one dilution, but the tighter rise is twofold. So why I'm telling this is that a fourfold change in tighter is equivalent to a change of two dilutions. That should be clear. You are diluting twice. Two dilution means fourfold change in the titer, which is taken as a clinically significant change. So this titer changes and the dilution comes, the importance comes when you treat a patient, you follow up the patient for treatment response. And that two dilution or fourfold change is what we are looking for after treatment. The titer should come down fourfold after a period of time. So this is a video. The heat inactivated syrup. The freshly prepared cardiolipin is taken. First, you have to prepare the cardiolipin antigen. In VDRL test, you have to prepare uh, the cardiolipin antigen, a buffered saline, transfer the 0.4 ml buffered saline. So 0.4 ml of buffered saline has been added. You have to transfer 0.5 ml of the antigen. This is the VDRL antigen. You are going to prepare the antigen, freshly prepare the antigen with buffered saline. You will shake the bottle vigorously.
to transfer the remaining 4.1 ml of the buffered saline into the bottle. And keep aside for 15 to 30 minutes for maturation. The antigen must be used on the same day itself. So you will inactivate the serum samples in a water bath at 56 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes. This is to inactivate the complement. You will take 50 microliters, that is 0 0.05 ml. and place it on the test, on the glass slide. A positive control and a negative control will be there. One drop of antigen is placed on each well using an 18 gauge needle. So initially the serum was added, then the antigen is now being added. The VDRL slide is placed on a shaker and rotated for four minutes, 180 revolutions per minute. Then the test is read using a compound microscope with a low power objective you are looking for flocculation. So medium to large clumps you will visualize, then the test is positive. So no clumps, negative, if it is negative, there will be no clumps. So once the results, the qualitative VDRL is reactive, it must be followed up with quantitative VDRL dilution test. So serial doubling dilutions of the serum is made in saline from 1 is to 2 to 1 is to uh, 1024.5 ml saline is taken in 10 test tubes. So serial dilutions are, is being done. So this is how you find out after serial dilutions, the tighter by serial dilution, you will find the highest dilution in which the flocculation is obtained and that highest dilution is taken as tighter. So the next test is, we have seen the VDRL test, the basic principles and the dilution. Next is RPR or the rapid plasma reagent test, which is the same principle as VDRL with a, uh, with, a few, with a few differences. It has got the same sensitivity as well as specificity as VDRL. But the difference from VDRL is that we, we, VDRL test requires a microscope for uh, visualizing the clumps or the flocculation. But RPR test is a macroscopic test which can be read with the naked eye. So addition of finely divided charcoal particles, that is the chromogen here, the finely divided charcoal particles are added to the VDRL antigen. So this helps in naked eye examination of the macro flocculation test. It's a macro flocculation test. So you can, with the naked eye, visualize that flocculation that is macroscopically. The advantages over VDRL are use of stabilized antigen. In VDRL test daily, you have to prepare the antigen. We had seen the VDRL antigen being prepared, prepared by using buffered saline. Here, stabilized antigen. It can be kept for six months at four to 10 degrees Celsius. Need not be prepared daily. It is disposable. You are instead of glass slide, you are using plastic cards, disposable cards instead of glass slides. Inactivation of serum is not required in RPR. Test may be carried out in both plasma as well as serum in case of RPR. So here is a comparison. VDRL test is a microflocculation test. RPR is a macroflocculation test. It can be read with naked eye. 
PDR is a glass light test, RPR is a card test. It can be disposed also. Serum should be heat, activa in heat inactivated in VDR to inactivate complement, whereas inactivation is not required in RPR test. And VDR test cannot be done on plasma, serum is required, whereas RPR can be done in serum as well as plasma. In VDR, the antigen should be freshly prepared, but that is not needed in RPR. The antigens can be stored for a period of six months at 4 to 10 degrees Celsius. Both are valid, equally valid assays. But you cannot compare VDR titer with RPR titer because VDR titers, the RPR titers are slightly higher than the VDR titers. If the result in VDR test is one is one is one in two dilution, RPR might give a result in one in four dilution. So the titers in RPR are slightly higher than VDR titers. So the same serological test should be used and, uh, that is used at the time of diagnosis should be done after treatment for follow-up also, yes, uh, particularly from the same lab. So here you can see RPR test positive, that macroflocculation is, you can see the charcoal, charcoal particles where the positive test negative is the uh, picture on the left side. And that is also serially diluted. So that is the basic principle. Uh, the reactor, the picture in the middle shows that in the presence of adequate antibody and antigen concentration, that is the chromosome particles are coated onto the antigen, there is a lattice formation. Antigen antibody lattice formation occurs in the zone of equivalence, antigen antibody equivalence, that is reactor. If there is excess antibody, this lattice formation will not take place and that is known as Prozone phenomenon. Prozone phenomenon, you can see the picture on the right side. There is antibody excess in conditions like HIV, hypergamma globulinemia. When there is excess antibodies, lattice formation do not take place and there is false negative VDR or RPR test. That is prozone phenomenon. It is can occur in HIV with syphilis. Trust is a modification of RPR and tolidin red is used as a toner. It has similar sensitivity and specificity. What is the importance of non-treponemal test? It is a semi-quantitative test. So we are actually uh, measuring it in titers. We need that to assess the disease activity. The baseline titer is very important, especially after treatment and for follow-up. And non-treponemal tests are easy to perform and cost-effective also. Serofastness. What do you mean by serofastness? These non-treponemal tests, VDR, RPR tests, they usually correlate with disease activity. In early infection, when the antibody titers are high, this quantitative titers are also very high. And it declines over a period of time. And even without treatment, these antibody titers can become non-reactive. Some adequately treated patients will have persistently reactive or serofast non-treponemal test. That is, they are adequately treated. The antibody titers do not become non-reactive. They persistently remain reactive at a low titer without become negative. So that is serofastness. Serofast reactivity is known to occur in 15 to 20% of patients with early syphilis and 35% of patients for late latent syphilis. False positive results can be technical false possible, false positive, variations in the normal, diseases allied to syphilis, yours, lesion, pinda, or biological false positive reactions. So you know, biological false positive reactions in VDR or RPR is seen acute reactions or chronic reactions, usually seen in infections, vaccination, pregnancy, drug addicts, autoimmune diseases. And infections like malaria, leprosy, uh, viral pneumonia can cause false positive reactions. So if a person is uh, having VDR or RPR positive, you should confirm it with a specific test. If the specific test is negative and the patient should be investigated for other autoimmune diseases or infections and repeated after six months. False negative result, we had already said, prozone phenomenon as it occurs in secondary syphilis, especially in HIV patients. 
due to the antibody excess prevents the antigen antibody proper binding and lattice formation and that gives false negative VDRL test. So this is prozone phenomenon already discussed. Uh, the picture B is the ideal lattice formation when there is zone of equivalence between antigens and antibodies. If there is excess antibody as seen in picture C, there is no flocculation and false negative VDR locus. In picture A, where there is antigen excess, then also flocculation does not occur and there is no lattice formation. So that is post zone phenomenon and antigen excess. Why do you have to do two serological tests in syphilis? So the initial screening test with the high sensitivity is used. That is the non treponemal test. So if it becomes positive, then definitely we have to confirm it with a specific treponemal test. There is always a chance of biological false positive reactions occurring with non treponemal tests like VDRL test. Traditional algorithm is a non-treponemal test, VDRL or RPR followed by treponemal test. That is what all of us do. Next, we'll go, go to treponemal test. Treponemal antigens to detect specific antibodies against treponemal pallidum cellular components. And the most commercial test used Nicole strain of treponemal pallidum as antigen. It usually becomes positive within three weeks of acquiring syphilis. It has got high sensitivity specificity. And treponemal test might become positive when shang primary shanger appears. FTABS is usually the first test that becomes positive, uh, usually by the third week of infection. And now it has been found that the treponema pallidum M enzyme immunoassays are highly sensitive to detect early syphilis also. All immunoassays are almost 100% sensitive in secondary syphilis. 95 to 100% sensitive in early latent syphilis and 86 to 98.5% sensitive in late latent syphilis. The specific tests are treponema pallidum immobilization test, treponema pallidum heme agglutination test, treponema pallidum particle agglutination test, or uh, treponema pallidum latex agglutination test, FTABS, treponema pallidum enzyme immunoassays, and treponema pallidum chemiluminescence assays. The, uh, about the treponemal test, one point that has to be kept in mind is that these specific tests remain reactive for life in patients with syphilis, even if they have received adequate treatment. But it has been found out that in 15 to 25% of patients treated during primary stage revert to serologically non-reactive after two to three years. And treponemal antibody titers, we have seen that some labs reporting TPHA, one in 640, but these antibody titers do not predict treatment response and should not be used for this purpose. It cannot differentiate active untreated syphilis from previously treated infection cannot be used to evaluate previously treated patients for possible reinfection also. So treponema pallidum immobilization test TPA uses virulent treponema pallidum, the Nicole strain. It detects specific antibody, uh, which inhibits the normal movements of treponema pallidum. You are taking, uh, you are observing it in the dark field microscope. The test is positive if 50% or more of treponemes are immobilized. Specificity is 100% but it is time consuming, expensive and not performed nowadays. TPHA is the most, the next test is treponema pallidum heme agglutination assay, TPHA, which is usually done in our hospitals and it is easy to perform. The basic principle is the sheep RBCs are treated uh, to absorb sonicated, these sheep RBCs are coated with ultrasonicated treponemes, the Nicole strain on their surface. When this sheep RBCs with treponemes on the surface are mixed with the patient's sera containing anti-treponemal antibodies, the cells are clumped. And positive results, you can see the picture on the left side. Gradual agglutination shows a smooth match of cells covering the entire bottom of the well. Whereas non-reactive is, you will see the definite compact red button in the center of the well. So it is 
uh, quite sensitive test, 80 to 100 percentage and specificity of 99 percentage. A negative TPHA result in the primary stage does not exclude syphilis. You have to re repeat the TPHA test after two weeks. It's a convenient test and large number of sera samples can be tested at one time. Treponema pallidum particle agglutination. It is the same principle as TPHA. It's just a modification. That is, instead of sheep RBCs, we are using gelatin particles. These gelatin particles are coated with Treponema pallidum, Nicole string, and then it is mixed with patient serum. So it is the same principle. Treponema pallidum particle agglutination assay. Now this test is increasingly used these days and it is used as the treponemal test of choice to confirm positive enzyme immunoassay test. Now CDC has recommended TPPA as the second treponemal test of choice to confirm positive treponema pallidum enzyme immunoassay. The first test, if you do an enzyme immunoassay indicated positive, that should be confirmed with the second treponemal test, that is TPPA. That when there are lots of advantages. It is easier to automate, uh, automate, become early in the course of primary infection. And it, it is almost always positive before the VDR test becomes positive. So early detection is an important feature of this treponemal test. Fluorescent treponemal antibody absorption test. It is the first to become positive in the third week of infection, highly sensitive and specific. It is an indirect immunofluorescence uh, technique. The killed treponema antigen on a slide and the patient's serum, uh, along with the fluorescent labeled anti-human gamma globulin is added. And then the slides are examined under fluorescence microscope for the presence of treponemes. It is difficult to perform and uh, good quality reagents are needed. It cannot screen a large number of slides at one time. So it is not recommended now as the first line confirmatory test. Enzyme immunoassays and chemiluminescence assays are the newer treponemal assays, and it has got excellent sensitivity and specificity. So in United States and uh, European countries, this treponemal assays are being used as the first line screening test instead of non-treponemal assays. It has got a high sensitivity and specificity to detect treponemes even in the early stage of syphilis. Many commercial available chemiluminescence assays and enzyme immunoassays are available in uh, US under different names. So next comes IgM antibody test. Why do you have to detect IgM antibody test? This is, it in, indicates IgM antibody uh, appears during the end of the second week of infection. It indicates recent infection. And it is especially important in congenital syphilis and neurosyphilis because in congenital syphilis, if treponema pallidum specific Ig and IgM antibodies are present in the blood of newborn, it definitely indicates congenital syphilis because IgG antibodies do IgM IgG antibodies can uh, tra travel through the placenta, whereas IgM antibodies do not cross the placenta. And if IgM antibodies are seen in congenital syphilis, then definitely the baby is having syphilis. In, uh, cerebros, in CSF also, if there is a specific IgM antibodies, it is neurosyphilis. So different diagnostic methods in different stages of syphilis helps in the diagnosis of the disease. For primary syphilis, dark ground microscopy, uh, polymerase chain reaction, serology can also help. Secondary syphilis, dark ground microscopy, polymerase chain reaction, immunohistochemistry, serology. Latent syphilis and tertiary syphilis, serology is usually the main diagnostic method for confirming the disease. Next is CNS involvement in syphilis, which we know that during any stage of syphilis, CNS can be involved, even from the primary stage to the tertiary stage. So do we have to do a CSF study in all patients with syphilis? No. If the patient is having positive serological, the positive TPHA results, the serological test of syphilis is positive, 
along with neurological signs and symptoms. The patient is having neurological signs and symptoms along with serological positivity. Then a detailed neurolog neurological evaluation and examination of CSF is needed. CDC does not recommend lumbar puncture in the absence of neurological symptoms. So previously for every case of uh, latent syphilis of unknown duration, we used to send the patient for a CSF study. But now CDC recommends that if the patient is not having any neurological symptoms or neurological signs, there is no need to do a CSF study. So di diagnosis of neurosyphilis depends on a combination of neurological signs and symptoms, reactive serological tests, non-treponemal and treponemal, along with CSF test where you will look the CSF cell count, protein, and reactive CSF VDR. Here, CSF VDR is very important in neurosyphilis. If a person has CSF VDR positivity, then that is VDR positivity in the cerebrospinal fluid, it is highly specific of neurosyphilis. So for a person with neurological signs or symptoms, a reactive CSF VDR is considered diagnostic of neurosyphilis. And does, even though CSF VDR is highly specific, but the sensitivity is low, 30 to 70 percentage. So when CSF VDR is negative, despite clinical signs of neurosyphilis, reactive serological test results, CSF changes, neurosyphilis should be considered. So clinically, the patient is having clinical signs of neurosyphilis and the serological tests for syphilis are positive. CSF pleocy lymphocytic pleocytosis or protein changes are observed. But when you do the CSF VDR, it becomes negative. Then one additional test you should, what they recommend, the CDC recommends is evaluation using fluorescent treponemal antibody absorption test. CSF study using fluorescent treponemal antibody absorption test or treponema paradigm particle agglutination testing on CSF. Now, if CSF fluorescent treponemal antibody absorption test or CSF treponema paradigm particle agglutination is negative, neurosyphilis is highly unlikely. So this is the traditional syphilis screening algorithm. Traditionally, what you do is first you will start with a non-treponemal uh, test like RPR. If it is reactive, you will do a specific test like treponema, uh, tre uh, if, uh, treponema paladum, particle agglutination or enzyme immunoassay or FTABS. Here we do TPHA. And if it is reactive, then there is syphilis infection and you will give treatment. If RPR is not reactive, then there is no serological evidence of syphilis. But if there is a, a high clinical suspicion, then you can repeat the RPR after one or two weeks and again do a specific test. What is reverse sequence serology algorithm? So in areas with high prevalence of syphilis, a strategy of reverse algorithm had been, has been adopted in many labs in America and Europe. Reverse sequence algorithm uses one treponemal test, that is the specific treponemal test such as enzyme immunoassay or chemiluminescence assay, followed by a non-treponemal test like RPR. So the advantage is that it identifies persons previously treated for syphilis or untreated syphilis or incompletely treated syphilis or patients with early syphilis. So it's a very good screening test, this enzyme immunoassay or chemiluminescence assay. If that becomes positive, then definitely you have to do a non-treponemal test like RPR for quantitative assessment. So this is reverse sequence algorithm. So next we'll see what is serological response to treatment. Uh, it is associated with multiple factors. The person's stage of syphilis, earlier stages are more likely to decrease fourfold and become non-reactive. So a person who is diagnosed in the early stage of syphilis and, give, and given treatment is like more likely to uh, become seronegative or non-reactive. 
Initially, non-toponymal antibody titers, if it is less than one in eight, they are less likely to decline fourfold than higher titers. Then the age of the patient, older patients are less likely to decrease fourfold than the younger patients. The titers in the older patients is less likely to decrease fourfold. How will you follow up a case of syphilis? Clinical and serological evaluation should be performed at six months, 12 months, and 24 months after treatment. So not only ser serological evaluation, clinical evaluation is also necessary at six months, 12 months, and 24 months after treatment. You are comparing the titer at the time of treatment. There should be ideally a fourfold decrease in titer by 12 months after treatment, a fourfold decrease in titer. It was one, if it was 1 in 32, then it should become 1 in 8 within 12 months. But clinical trial data have shown that 10 to 20 percentage of patients will not achieve this, even uh, achieve this decrease in fourfold after treatment, that is within 12 months. So some patients can have a decrease in fourfold even after 12 months of treatment. If the patient has clinical recurrence, when you, the patient is coming for follow-up and you are evaluating clinically and serologically, you are seeing that there is clinical recurrence or persistence of the clinical lesions along with fourfold rise in the RPR titer or VDRL titer. Then think about reinfection or treatment failure. In case of uh, patients with HIV and primary and secondary syphilis, they are evaluated clinically and serologically for treatment failure at three months, six months, nine months, 12 months, and 24 months. So initially it is at every three month interval till one year, and then it is at 24 months after therapy. That is in HIV and early syphilis. In patients with HIV and latent syphilis, then they are clinically and serologically evaluated at six months, 12 months, 18 months, and 24 months after treatment. And CSF examination and retreatment can be considered for persons whose non-treponemal test titles do not decrease fourfold within 24 months of therapy. So the, uh, the patient should be kept under follow-up for uh, at least 24 months if the patient has got a child. And pregnancy, all women should be screened serologically for syphilis at the first prenatal visit itself, twice during the third trimester, ideally. At 28 weeks gestation, it should be done. And CDC now suggests that at the time of delivery, pregnant women should be screened for syphilis. Any woman who has a fetal death after 20 weeks of gestation should be tested for syphilis. And if syphilis is diagnosed and treated during gestation, serological titers should be repeated again at delivery. All neonates born to mothers who have reactive test results should be evaluated with a quantitative non-troponemal serological test. That is, the neonatal serum is taken for testing, RPR or VDR. And all neonates born to women who have reactive non-troponemal tests for syphilis and delivery should be examined thoroughly for the evidence of congenital syphilis. And if there are features of congenital syphilis, then you have to they do a dark field microscopic examination or PCR testing of suspicious lesions of body fluid. That is the bullous rash or nasal discharge should also be performed. And pathological examination of the placenta or umbilical cord using specific staining should also be done, silver staining. So to conclude, I would like to say investigation, syphilis is a multi-stage disease and investigations depend upon the stage of the disease. And early syphilis, the direct identification of troponemes is done in during the early stage and serological tests are useful in, is useful in all stages, but especially during the late stages. And it is not, not one test is Diagnostic of syphilis, uh, different tests are available. And in serological testing, a non-treponemal followed by treponemal is the traditional algorithm. But now all over the world, not all over the world, in some countries, the reverse sequence algorithm is being followed where treponemal test is first being done followed by 
non-trepidating milk test. Thank you. Eminent speakers of Dr. Raju Pariyaram as well as Dr. Reena Chandran. Thanks for sharing your sharing your thoughts, Doctor. It is great to hear uh, both speakers' presentation was helpful for our postgraduates. It's always beneficial to gain clinical insights and learn from the experiences of experts in the field. And our research pharma is reassured this type of programs will seem to be continued with the valuable academic programs for the postgraduates' benefits in this low platform. Have a great day to all. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Doctor. Thank you so much, Doctor.